Is this a case of the irresistible force meeting the immovable object? Yeah. Yes, it is. Which are you? I don't know. Who is that? Yeah. How long do you want? How long would you like? How long? How much yeah. time? Four hours? <laughs> no, I'm saying okay to start. Yeah, yeah okay. I'll be... uh, how long I want to speak? Yeah. Uh, 25 maximum 30. Okay. That's excellent. Uh, let's see. <laughs> okay, I. First of all, I want to thank the uh, organizers who have invited me. Uh, Usually I, I ask myself if they know me enough because it's very strange, I think they will be disappointed after. Uh, probably not many of you have noticed my t-shirt yesterday. Uh, it was a t-shirt with the Sheldon of the Big Bang Theory, but the phrase was there is a fine line delineating wrong from vision. But unfortunately, you have to be a visionary to see that line. I hope you see that line. Uh, the title I changed it slightly. Uh, originally, it was uh, Which Crisis of Which Capitalism? Marxian Political Economy and Financial Keynesianism. Then I decided to put, after these days, the critiquing. Uh, well, my. my my discourse is telling something that I know about the crisis. It's not all that has to be said about the crisis, but it's what I think uh, I can contribute. Uh, John asked to start saying what is the main point of the paper. Uh, I would put it that way. Marx's critique of political economy is about 150 years old. What is today a Marxian critique of political economy? I think that we have to do like Marx, but not to repeat Marx. And Marx thought that he could criticize capitalism uh, confronted with theory of its time. Hmm? So uh, we have to at least deal with the political economy of the 20th century, not only uh, Ricardo. I think there was a polit political economy of the 20th century. And we have to deal with the changed form of capitalism. It is still capitalism, but in a changed form. Uh, in my view, this means that we have to confront, but also incorporate the truths which are contained in what I would like the monetary theory of production, circuit theory of money for, for, for others, and financial Keynesianism, uh, means key, essentially. This has to do with what is the meaning of critique. Critique is not criticism. It's not just rejecting as false uh, bourgeois theory. It's uh, taking the, the scientific part of bourgeois theory and incorporating, incorporating it. And we have to deal with the novel features of neoliberalism. John asked also uh, how uh, each paper relates to the theme uh, of the topic or the theme of the book. Well, I could say as a in that advertiser, if you want an unconventional view of what neoliberalism was, what financialization meant, of the changes in productive, capi productive capital and labor, on the how and why of the great meltdown, on how the European crisis relates to the global crisis, on why Minsk is important and what they need in socialism, this is the paper. But actually, <laughs> this is a joke because the connection is in the title which crisis or which capitalism. Uh, the paper has this structure. Uh, I will give it a thread, otherwise I really would be uh, five hours. Uh, it starts with a discussion on Marxian crisis theory, then it explains why from there we have to, to, to um, go into the discussion of financial Keynesianism. Unfortunately, I will use financial Keynesianism sometimes as only referring to Minsky, sometimes as referring to those authors who stress finance uh, in capitalism. Then it goes to a discussion of neoliberalism, which I do not see as a lesser fair configuration. For me, it is a very active political configuration. And I would call it as a privatized Keynesian. So I give some uh, something on the ascent and collapse of neoliberalism as privatized Keynesianism. 
There is a part of the paper about the crisis in Europe where I discuss also neo-mercantilism. Then I more or less conclude uh, saying that both Marxian theory and financial mechanism are essential to understand this crisis, but they need to be updated. There should be substantial uh, changes. The conclusions are more or less about economic policy. Uh, I owe a great deal to others. Many are here, and they are so in my DNA since I was young, or I was young, that I do not even quote them anymore. But I don't name them also because I know that you will disagree with the user than with you, so it's better to do this. But in general, uh, my paper is full of borrowed tunes, to quote Neil Young. I start with something uh, which may appear unrelated to the paper, and actually it is the foundation. Uh, as I said, I, 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 I take the, the, the paper as mostly, uh, mostly right. <coughs> I start with a warning. The reading of Marx must be historicized. This is a thesis by Karl Koch. You read Marx at a certain point, so the same text changes their meaning, and also specialized. My imprinting is late 60s, early 70s, in an Italian Western city, especially Turing, who was a center of class struggle, working class struggle in, in those years. Then, of course, the experience of living in the neoliberal era and its collapse is, is relevant. Uh, well, let me try to uh, say what is Capital Book One, at least for three fourths of it. The thesis by Marx is this value is the gelatin of labor. Actually, it is a ghost. Strictly speaking, it does not exist. Uh, it is immaterial if we look at the single commodity. This, this ghost must take possession of a body, the body of money as a commodity. So we are in a ghost story. Hmm? When this happens, money is a chrysalis, value as money has become a, a, a chrysalis, which has to turn into a butterfly. That is, uh, it is fixed, the value fixed in money as a commodity, crystallized in money as a commodity, must fly, become money producing money, capital. Hmm? By the way, I did the, the slides yesterday morning, before, <laughs> before I even uh, David. Uh, well, we could say that at this point, Marx is more or less like Hegel. Uh, this capitalist reality is very Hegelian, except for the fact that Marx thinks this is a crazy uh, reality. The point is that here there is a turtle. The chrysalis can become a butterfly only if the butterfly turns into a vampire sucking living labor from workers. In capitalism, workers are free human beings. So exploitation here has a novel dimension, and the novel dimension is that human uh, workers are, have, uh, are the appendix of their labor power, and from their labor power, there must be the extraction of living labor, but that's the problem. The problem is that the labor power is attached uh, uh, to, to the workers, and living labor is the activity of labor power. So this creates a specific social problem in capitalism. You can have the means of production, whatever, but you can produce and produce capital only if you use workers, if you consume workers. So at the class level, the all new value comes from living labor. This is an argument relating new value in the money form to living, uh, to living labor. At this point, capital has become a monster which incorporates workers as bearer of living labor power, uh, which becomes in activity living labor. It is objectualized in, uh, uh, in the commodity 
and then when there is the, uh, the metamorphosis into money becomes a social labor. At this point, the monster, we are in the world of Frankenstein, uh, starts to work as if it were by love possessed. The ghost, the chrysalis, the butterfly, the vampire, the monster, and the mouse. The mouse which is poisoned and becomes uh, thirst from life to death. What follows is Marx is a macro-social capitalist uh, theory of exploitation, the conceptual work, is the surplus value. What is important in all this? This is the only monetary labor theory of value. The only serious monetary theory. You can uh, divide value from money. This is a strong argument for me. It means that the link between value and labor goes through money as a commodity. Money as a commodity has not to start a reference to the monetary system, this comes later. It has a, a meaning relative to the argument why money is uh, uh, why money is representing value as nothing but labor. This is the first uh, connection between money, uh, money, value, and labor. Then there is the theory of the origin of new value, the one I, I, I said before, which is partially independent. And for me, it's independent from the theory of money as a commodity. Why? Because the theory of money as a commodity looks at money as universal equivalent. Huh? But there is another notion of money. Money is finance to production. When Marx shifts from the first section to the others, he assumes that finance to production is money through money as, uh, as gold. Then there are a lot of other things on which I, I, I don't go. I just want to alert you of the distinction between capital as a fetish uh, and capital fetishism. This distinction comes from a colleague of Al, Hans Erbach, and it is quite right. Uh, the social pro properties of capital as a fetish are real. For example, in this argument, gold as money as social property, in this social reality. This is the notion of fetish. Fetish is to think that gold, as a natural element in any society, has social properties. Uh, this is the first argument, the one which led to, um, to the butterfly, or better, to the, to the chrysalis. But after, there is another problem of Marx, the non hegelian problem of Marx. How this totality, how this capital fetish, which is a subject, how it is constituted through uh, social agency, through uh, struggles. And it, this is what happens in chapter 7, in my view. Uh, what is problematic in this argument? It may be money as a commodity, but not just in itself, because there, there is a lot of things which are sensible. Money as a commodity, that is money as money, not money as currency, is mostly relevant in crisis. And this is a very good argument. The, the problem is in the analysis of capitalism, where uh, I think uh, money as finance to production at the beginning of the circuit, uh, the, the labor market through the production process, uh, must be taught, in my view, as essentially a non-commodity element. I have no time to go into the detail, and I try to be very, very quick on, uh, on the topics of the uh, paper. Uh, then, the first, the first line of argument is about Marx and crisis theory. I read the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. I read, I'm not saying this is what Marx actually does, as a meta theory of the crisis. As I said yesterday, uh, there is a reason why there is a tendency to the rate of profit to fall, but this tendency is counteracted. Uh, by other factors, and they win. I think it is a very good organizing uh, tool to look at uh, the big crisis in capitalism. I start with the long depression, 
That was a classical tendency of the rate of profit to fall because your uh, uh, value composition went up. The counter tendency is warm, including Ford is meant terrorism. I don't tell you why I put Ford into the Ford terrorism, but this could be <laughs> relevant. This creates a huge increase in productivity and the condition for realization crisis. So first, a profitability crisis. Later, too much, uh, too less, too, not too much profit. Later on, <coughs> too much profits. Uh, a realization crisis. Not an underconsumption crisis. In my there is no underconsumption. There could be, as Luxembourg uh, says, an underinvestment view. Then, there were a uh, reaction, the war, etc. The crisis of the 70s was again a profitability crisis, but not the classical tendency of the rate of profit to fall. It was a social crisis because of tension on the rate of surplus value. Everybody who looks at this says, oh, this is a profit squeeze through wages. I am not saying that the wage struggle were not relevant, but I never understand why Marxists don't look at workers as workers. And in the place I live, that they think, in most places in the world, a problem for capital was not the only problem, but it was the key problem, was to extract living labor in those technical uh, and organizational configuration uh, in the amount and the quality needed. So the crisis of the 70s was a social crisis directly, if you wish, in the capital relation. Then there is neoliberalism into the lesser depression, which is a topic later on. Well, I think that the monetary theory of production, mainly Graziani, is important for the stress of uh, the banking system financing capitalist first production. Beware, finance to production is not finance to investment. I realized that my exchange yesterday with Angela. Uh, was wrong on, on my side. We were discussing of different things. I was discussing of recent financial uh, finance production. He was start discussing of, uh, in my view, financing investment. Minsky is important, yes, for the, for the financial instability hypothesis, but actually the financial instability hypothesis has theoretical, theoretically has problems. It is more interesting the idea that stability is that stabilizing that there must be an increase in leverage, not as in the classical Minsky non-financial business, but of private agents, and as I'd say later, maybe other, other stuff. But I want to stress that these thinkers in the 70s were mainly critics of Keynesian, Keynesianism, and even of Keynes himself. Another thing which is important for both is a radicalized version of the notion of Keynes of socialization of investment. Then we have a neoliberalism. Well, as I said, I think it's no lesser fair but a politically managed form of capitalism. There I refer to some uh, interesting books on this uh, topic. Uh, what it was, I said privatized Keynesian is, it is a term which was used also by, uh, by Colin Croach. My idea is very simple. Monetarism lasted three years, 79-82. That would have created the conditions of a new great crash like in the 70s. After 82, there is a, a great Keynesian camp coming into the arena, and it is the second record. We born as Keynesian in Port Krugman would go. But really, neoliberal, neoliberalism comes on its own with Alan Greenspan, 87-2000. And for 2005. What is the financialization of the Greenspan era? I call it a real subsumption of labor, if you wish, also, which should go into the details of the distribution, etc., to finance. Finance meaning stock exchange and, uh, and even debt. It is what Minsky calls money manager capitalism. Mm -hmm. What is this difference specific of this financialization? That the pools. Of, of, of savings of households, it is not a quantitative argument, it is a qualitative argument, are uh, managed in an alienated way by money managers. They go into the stock uh, exchange, uh, create a capital market inflation, 
uh, influence, as I said in a comment, corporate governance, leading to deindustrialization and centralization without concentration and transnational chains of production. Uh, this was managed through a new monetary policy which had an, an endogenous money, it's not monetary, Ala Friedman, uh, as I said, capital market inflation, and yes, full employment, full employment of a precarious labor force, where the, the, the term working poor had the opposite meaning than in Adam Smith. Hmm? Uh, so we had also not only an horizontal money supply, but the tendency to an horizontal Phillips curve for some years. My thesis is that there were a lot of disequilibria in the stock exchange, in the housing market later on, in the, uh, in the trade accounts, uh, but they, well, they were stabilizing. The dynamic side of capitalism is impossible without this finance and this disequilibrium. And what they were doing, go back at the reason of the crisis of the 70s for me. They were actually destroying objectively the capital fetish and subjectively uh, speaking the, the constitution problem, the, the strength of the working class. So it was, yes, as I said yesterday, a natural um, number. So this model was what I would say a model of traumatized workers, not by definition, Greece by definition. Uh, which turned it, which somehow were related to manic savers, the capital market inflation, allowing them to have indebted consumption. So, as I said in a comment, this model was able to, um, uh, to create a new autonomous demand, which was politically managed. After investment, after net export, which are not there for the world as a whole, after government expenditure, as in the Keynesian era. Uh, indebted uh, consumption. It is a kind of extension of a Luxembourg Kaleski model. Luxembourg turned into Kaleski, uh, but adapted to neoliberalism. Uh, well, now for something completely different European crisis. The European crisis is related to the global, for somebody, US crisis until the 2009. This crisis was 2007, mid 2007, mid 2009. But it was an important crisis. It was not due to the Europe. In the 90s, I was against the euro. I would advise anybody not to enter into the euro. Being into the euro is another different world. My problem was to understand why it worked for 10 years. And, uh, and it was not the, crisis, the reason of the crisis, nor the trade, the trade accounts. Yes, there are institutional design programs, the ECB, but they are changing. They are using the crisis to change uh, the social structure, but also the institutional setting of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Europe. Uh, what we have to look is how in Europe in the last 15, 20 years, finance and the industry has really been integrated. So, for example, you don't understand anything of Europe if you don't look at Germany, which moved from a ma productive matrix, very compact, all inside Germany, diffusing this eastward, so that actually an impulse to effective demand in Germany probably will go more to, uh, to the demand of a means of production eastwards than demand of consumption goods for the south of Europe. And by the way, the south of Europe, the periphery, south plus uh, Ireland, is made by five different models. So the proposal of exiting the euro, the euro of the south, etc., in itself, do not work because of, since there is a financial integration, if you, what you need from the exchange rate is a high exchange rate or a stable exchange rate. From the trade side, you need a devaluation, but it depends on the structure of your imports, raw materials, uh, etc. Uh, I come from a country, Italy, in which we had repeatedly devaluations. Not in Chile. 
those who think that Europe created the neoliberal pressure on workers simply forget what happened 20 years later. The pressure on the, uh, uh, at the euro level against workers comes from the national capital pressures, which are, of course, in a hierarchy. Uh, uh, my common theme is that the so-called financialization, it's a term that I don't like, actually fosters in a contradictory way exploitation because women in the, in, in the labor market, higher working day, also because of their certainty, higher intensity of labor. I think that financialization even fosters uh, on a global level the extraction of relative surplus value and through the mechanism of index consumption even created consumption for production. So you had a uh, driving force to produce, to extract uh, new living labor and add the possibility to extract new living labor. So what I say is that look, there is a new form of exploitation, but it's not a new exploitation. A new form of the same old exploitation. There may be profit of alienation, uh, something like that, but it's not the core of my argument. Uh, it's really a pity that we, we do not have uh, here uh, arguments about the gender dimension, but the gender dimension here is crucial before and after uh, the, the crisis. I said the feminization of the labor uh, force, but uh, I would say also uh, the, the increase of the domestic uh, labor for the attack on the welfare, but after the crisis, according to the, to the different uh, uh, systems in the different countries, you may have a rise in the participation in the labor market of women if the sectors in crisis were male dominated, and since the attack will be everywhere on the public sector, this will react back on the conditions of women. And in Italy, the care for elderly labor is done mostly by migrants, women migrants. And there is a conflict which is uh, starting to, to go on between these two sections of... Uh, you can understand this. This is a position which is quite diffused in Italy, and it says, we should go back. I don't have an Italian lira sounds much better than I don't have in Europe. Sorry, you've already exceeded your requested uh, time, but that was very minimal. So I, 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 Ten I, I, more minutes, no more. How much? Ten, no more. No, four, because this is the last, uh, the last time. Okay, great. So, I it is, as I said, the Luxembourg Kareski model. Uh, what is the problem of the Graziani circuit theory of money and usual the Graziani circuit of money? It is said, look, yes, that may work uh, when uh, there was mainly bank finance to capitalist production. It does not work anymore because the inflow has a different me mechanism going through, even for households. The, uh, um, the, the, the financial intermediaries, etc. Yes, I would say that an important point of Graziani was to stress that in the 70s, most of the surplus value went into the banking sector because of the rise of, of the nominal rate of uh, interest, but that the government deficits of the 70s and of the 80s were instrumental to the disintermediation of the film sector from, uh, uh, from banks. Why? Because the private sector, the firms, gained money for free. Money for free means money which is not charged of interest and you don't have to go to give back to the, to the loaner. So Graziani would say it is the government deficit and it would be, it, 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 it were also the, the global imbalances which created the world of debtors and creditors with the uh, uh, speculative dimension after 71. About Minsky, well, let me provoke it. The financial instability hypothesis does not work, as it does not work before the greater profit in the strictly original form. But it is interesting because of its repression. 
That is, the fact that the financial stability hypothesis is do not work means that the desired increase in leverage is repressed when the economy goes well. So you are willing to go into a higher expected uh, leverage at an even more fragile position. But for me, the really interesting point in Minsky is the late Minsky stage theory of capitalism. He divided capitalism in different stages. And the last one was the money manager capitalism, stressing the relationship between financiers and uh, those who were financed. For me, what is interesting is the policy criticism of Keynes. Go and read the last two chapters of John Minor uh, Keynes of 75. He is very hard. His criticism of capitalism, the Keynesian capitalism, is very hard. Uh, his solution was already to go out of Keynesian in the mid 70s, was to go to a situation in which uh, a socialization of the economy, uh, the, the, the state as defining not only the level but also the composition of output. Uh, we would say to produce use value for others. It was the socialization of employment, the state as direct employer, uh, the socialization of the monetary. This is an inspiration. Again, I know, I'm not saying that I buy the way these socializations are in Minsky. But this view is important because what, what does Minsky do? He put together uh, Keynesian theory and the New Deal, a kind of radicalized uh, New Deal. Uh, which way out? I think we are living a long, deep structural change. It is still going on. There is no exit clearly or, or outside, but this is a, not a mechanical view. I agree with those who say that, of course, there will be institutional changes to have a, uh, the upper uh, side of the cycle. This requires a new crucial role for state and government expenditure. But I completely agree with, with them because that this may come from the right, hmm? sooner or later. Uh, so there is no, no guarantee. Uh, there will be, however, no progressive changes if there are no struggles from below. We should ask what is socialist for us. Uh, I have these two, de two definitions. It is immediately social labor upon the production. It's very difficult to think of it, but this is this goes directly through the Marxian categories. But it is also used value for others from socialized labor. Another big difference of capitalism was that labor in production became for the first time socialized. But it was not socialized in circulation. So you have to relate the two things. Well, this is an utopia dimension. But I think that the um, socialization of the economy view is the way to go in that direction. What it is? Capitalism or socialism? I don't know. It's surely it is a very inherently unstable uh, situation. But this, what can give to struggles from below a kind of organizing frame? Hmm? Uh, let me close on another issue with two or three minutes. I am happy to be here at what can, can be called a Marxist conference. But if I go back when I became a Marxian, I prefer to say a Marxian, the reason was that I was not becoming a, a, an economist or doing science. In my view, in Marxism, there is the impossibility to separate science from politics. It is a project of human liberation to change the world we live in. What is the world we live in now? It is a world of class exploitation, it is a world of patriarchy, it is a world where natural disruptions have been increased, it is also the world of religious oppression and authoritarian governments. Not only action matters, also inaction, and also uh, taking a stand. Jules Bendard talked about la trahison de the, uh, the Betrayal of the intellectuals. I use that term in a slightly different way because he thought, he thought that talking of class struggle was a betrayal of the intellectuals. I think exactly the opposite now. Now, here in Izmir, 
We are in Turkey, not too many kilometers from here. There have been in the past massacres, and today, passive inaction may lead to very nasty uh, situation. I think, just as an individual, that this should interrogate us. This should interrogate us. And it is difficult for me to think that this conference is out of time and out of space discussing very fine scientific matters about the present. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation and also for superb timekeeping. <laughs> Um, Johnny has asked me to remind you to send in your questions for discussion. Three questions. Mine? Everybody. Ah, everybody. Well, thank you. Otherwise, I think we have half an hour or so for discussion. So it's in the first place. I can have an indication of those who wish. I come here, you know, to scare you. Same old, same old. <laughs> Just, oh, yeah, same old, same old. Okay, I'll go anti-clockwise in this. No, that's confidence, that's good. So, John Stavros. First, I think it's... Uh, same old, same old, but I just want to say more. Go on then. Uh, I think Evan says that this social labor is, uh, excuse me, uh, is extremely important. And uh, one of the questions that we put out for discussion this afternoon is uh, productive and unproductive labor, and that's uh, absolutely crucial to us today because it relates to the question labor organized under capitalism and uh, capitalist relations and non-capitalist relations such as uh, household, uh, uh, household labor. Second point I want to make, uh, it isn't one of your most important points, I'll let other people do that, but still I think it, uh, uh, particularly the non-Europeans uh, uh, should, um, should note it, that uh, while I certainly agree with you that uh, it's a question of the exploitation of the national capitalist class and their attempts to uh, extract uh, a surplus uh, value that is key. The introduction of the euro was a big change, and it's one that's a big change in capitalist uh, uh, institutions, which probably that I think Marxists need to uh, 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 analyze. Certainly, if we had a world currency, we would have a different type of, of uh, international financial market uh, than we do, uh, and so that the euro represents, I think. Uh, something uh, that we should look at. Also, my last point, it relates to a worrisome, I think quite obvious trend, uh, you know, that Mitterrand had in mind that the Euro would be the vehicle to prevent Germany from ever again dominating Europe. Instead, it becomes the vehicle by which there's a return to the German problem. Germany dominating Europe. Thank you. I should answer. If you wish. I wish. Uh, there are three questions. And the three questions are big. I try to be uh, very short. Uh, I agree generally on the, on, on the first issue about the relevance of productive and productive labor, etc. I just want to let you know that I do not think that there is a social labor before the actualization of value in exchange. This has to do with the fact that labor is a very complex category and must realize a kind of uh, decent taxonomy in my view only in the third or even second uh, edition of capital. If you go to the group, it says labor means everything and use it usually, meaning everything. So labor in production is tentatively social labor. It is labor which has to become social in exchange. It is not just private because it is already organized for the exchange. No? So here yeah, I would go into Rubin's uh, way. Maybe we will discuss about production and productive labor. For me, everything which builds the commodity as a use value is productive. So I have a large view of productivity. This is again in a chapter mostly in Harvard, the last chapter of Rubin's uh, book. The second point, uh, I understand that there can be uh, a misunderstanding here. I am not <coughs> contrasting 
a static view of national uh, versus European or global. I almost never use the word globalization because for me they are uh, fake, fake emotions. Uh, I think that we are in a situation in which the nation is surpassed below and after, but it's still relevant. It is mostly relevant from the point of view of the maybe, uh, capitalist classes. What I'm just saying is that, yes, the euro was a big change. Hello, you're talking to a lot of people. So, uh, a big, I, I told it, a big change, but um, uh, the point is that the pressure to build the euros came before. So you can kill the euro. This does not mean that those pressures uh, goes away. More away, the transition is very, 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 very complicated. Before uh, the, the euro, I was with those French economists who proposed a kind of Keynes plan for Europe. Uh, the French have, has it today. It is called la monnaie commune, the common money, which is not the single currency. The problem is that those who say this today uh, are simply not understanding that it is a journey to hell, going the transition today, not then. The last point is very big, so I say nothing. Just I agree completely with you that the project of the euro was a French project. Germany always resisted. The Maastricht Treaty was designed before the collapse of the USSR. For me, in 1992-1993, the single currency project was dead. It came back again. It would be interesting. And the US story is very relevant here. It came back in 1995 96 uh, The point is that there are many difficulties, but today we have to look at Germany because Germany is thinking of going east, but it can do that because most of its exports are, are uh, in Europe. So we are, we are in track. There will be a solution. The only solution we could work, it will never happen probably, it is Germany out of Europe. <laughs> I'll be sure that we will pay you. Just one minute. <laughs> probably a fourth point. First, I totally disagree that trade imbalances have gone away. I totally disagree that uh, trade imbalances have gone away with Target 2. Target 2 is a mechanism of monetary equilibration that is moving the, the money uh, around. But uh, trade the imbalances remain, so I think. This, this is not a correct uh, uh, point we've made. Mm -hmm. uh, second point, um, I, I didn't gather for, for, from what you, you were saying, what's your opinion, what's the, the current problem? Okay, it's not a, 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 of, of Europe. Uh, it is a, you said that it's not a Eurozone crisis. Okay, but there is certainly a European malaise there. What are its causes? Or isn't there any malaise at all? Uh, so, what is your diagnosis about that? Uh, then, from this third question, okay, I'm not for simply extinguishing the euro. I think that I tried to show the day before yesterday that this is uh, usually some less uh, uh, going together with uh, total dismantling of the common market and political structure or leaving them or else a, a single move which is not a solution. But the argument that, okay, why does, we, we had national currencies in the past and uh, we had devaluations and did, uh, this didn't work, it's a very broad argument. Well, they were in the past successful and most successful devaluations and it changed much more value. Good for And the fourth is, uh, is the guy, uh, 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 no, no, oh, okay. According to my job. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's not uh, And uh, the, the fourth is about means. Okay, uh, I'm sympathetic with your argument that means was a, 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 in a sense a critique of Keynesian. 
um, and probably from left wing quarters. But uh, then we have to, to, to stick to some uh, definite points, not uh, stretch things around and say, okay, I like this point from Minsk and not the other. You can stretch uh, the Minsk approach from the left and say it was a big and interesting because it pointed out the monetary dimensions are uh, probably weak in traditional um, Keynesian uh, uh, theory. Uh, but uh, you, it can be stretched from the other side, like this, from the right wing, for example. How do you make that? Uh, Minsk, uh, the Bernanke, for example, as uh, how can you say? Uh, he is sympathetic to Minsk as well. Hmm. Uh, uh, really, uh, uh, it's okay for me to be criticized. But what I said, I didn't say that the Ukraine imbalances are punished. By the way, I'm one of those, uh, for example, with George Farrelly, but not only in America, it's a analysis of European and other countries saying to the, uh, at least progressive economists in Italy, but also elsewhere, who stress very much the issue of the stability pact, that they were not really an incredible and great trade imbalances. I am just saying, what you said, that it was not because of this crisis, and the 32 is a monetary mechanism uh, to adjust them. But it is a preliminary there. If nothing is done, one area will become poorer, and another area will become richer, and this creates contradictions which will go back to, uh, to economics. By the way, if you do a single currency, it is nothing. Even at the change rate, you can't think of a single currency area if it is an exchange rate mechanism. Otherwise, you are simply saying that you are not wanting to do what you are doing. In Italy, probably Greece, in the US, everywhere, nobody expects that one region is in trade uh, balance with the other regions. Uh, then, uh, I said that the crisis in Europe, 2007, 2009, was important. Was not because of the euro in itself. Was not because of the trade imbalances in itself. Then it came here, and all the institutional mechanisms, the imbalances, made it worse. But it was an important crisis. Later on, the crisis was originated from the inside. Huh? I, I am saying that the program has more to do with institutional dimension, mm -hmm. but it must be seen as then a trade imbalance. It must be seen as a crisis of restructuring, economic and social uh, restructuring, in a very uh, uncertain environment. Uh, I am for no single solution. I agree that there been uh, devaluation which has been successful. I am simply saying that if the problem global, but also inside Europe, and what I am saying, just a change in the exchange rate uh, is no solution because it requires credit policies together, industrial policies, uh, geography here it is very, it is very uh, important. Uh, I know that here I am coming in a very difficult situation because if things are this way, you are not really in a communist Marxian position and you are depicting a, a, a solution let us say a structural Keynesian solution, eh, which is harder than and more difficult than communism. But since I don't know what is communism, this is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> eh, about uh, Minsky, yes, it can be used uh, from many points uh, of view, right, left, etc. I am just saying that. The argument of the socialization of investment in 75, when this theory was not so good in my view, uh, was very leftist, uh, almost socialist, uh, and very radical. I think that the substance didn't change too much. But later on, there were important additions. The reference to Kalevsky, uh, stage theory, the money mail. He never get to put them all together. So, as like Marx, I am not an orthodox Minsk. 
I think that it was very influenced by the depression. So, mid 70s, very critical opinion. Early 80s, yes, the same argument, but he says, oh, well, uh, there is Reagan. It was better in the Keynesian era. After 89, 90, 91, he says, socialism, it's a failure. What we have to do is to find the condition of successful, successful capitalism. But he says, there are 57. And they give you one of the 57. What would he say when capitalism, neoliberalism, collapsed? I don't know. I am not interested. I'm poor, but I'm not interested. I think that, for me, it is useful to read those parts of history and to put them in, in, in a kind of Marxian framework. I have only one question. <laughs> As people say, it's a quick question, but that doesn't say whether the answer is quick. Uh, you, uh, you argue that one should understand uh, neoliberalism as politically managed uh, capitalism. Uh, one could equally describe the previous post-World War II form of capitalism as politically managed capitalism. So how, would you, how do you differentiate, how do you distinguish between these two forms. What is distinctive about the neoliberal form in that case? I think actually I did it. I say it is Keynesianism because probably before, but surely after 30, there has always been a management of the man. Always. The form changes. If we take US capitalism, and it is prioritized because the form changes. If we take capitalism uh, after 45, 50, because of many social, international conditions, the past, uh, recent past, uh, etc., the point was to have uh, US as a kind of conscious hegemon, or Germany is not. After 47, 48, they realized that they had to take them with them. But the heart was military expenditure waste, etc. All that is good of the so-called compromise between capital and labor came from struggles. And the good things about welfare, etc. came in the 60s, 70s. I think that actually Keynesian was already beginning to collapse in the mid-60s. One of, of the <laughs> origin is the origin, actually. It's not the only one, the, the, the social structure of uh, uh, accumulation. Then, they had this program which was prepared, but it was not just a plan uh, of dismantling the, the, the strength of the working class, of changing all the money manager stuff, beginning in the 60s, eh? from the individual actors uh, in the US, in the, in the Euro, uh, dollar area, etc. Uh, the, there are many kind of policies which we which I think I can make. One, I mean, privatized, which I demand monetary policy. Hmm? Uh, I can give you the reference to a paper by the Cecco, who said, in the uh, <coughs> central bank as lender of first resort. As soon as labor was traumatized and there was no risk of, of uh, inflation from there, uh, sorry, uh, what, what I, what, uh, uh, what happened? They, they had no problem in increasing money as long as it's fed into capital uh, market inflation. And this, they realized, they learned in time, that it gave very positive conditions. So a new, you know, if you want the, the, uh, the Taylor curve, it, it's a representation in orthodoxy of, of this. But take the book by Mazzucato. Mazzucato, the general state, takes the United States and says, look, Innovation comes from the entrepreneurial role of the U.S. Reagan, Star Wars, uh, a lot of that stuff. It was not started from being good, but it was a very interventionist. Uh, I think somebody you can say something for 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 Germany. So it was very very active uh, configuration. Uh, I think, but I can go into that that we should understand that for the mainstream changes 
not only because of the imperfections, I'm not talking about them, they are the basis of social media. But also for what may appear the, the, the orthodox, very orthodox guy. They have not anymore the idea that there is a natural equilibrium. For them, equilibrium is policy constructed. That is, look at their editorial accounts in the in newspapers. The thing is, we must construct a society for which the free market uh, works. And when there are failures in the free markets, they are organizing regulation, intervention. So I, I understand that it's a complicated area. But I don't buy the fact that it is less fair. I, I know only of one case of less fair, which was a kind of mercantilist or mercantilist. It was in as the first powerhouse, manufacturing powerhouse of the world. The free market then what put man to invade. The other market. Later on, name me one case of successful lesser fair. Not Germany, not Japan, not the, the uh, dragons of East Asia, not China. I'm with you. Uh, I want to start by thanking Ricardo for reminding us of what binds us in this fractious uh, context, and all such contexts are fractious. Uh, and it's our attitude towards the capitalist mode of production and our absolute recognition that it is neither uh, ineluctable nor uh, without tremendous miseries attached to it. Then the issue is what differentiates us. Uh, and I think what differentiates us is how to move from some common starting points towards the concrete. That's my sense of this conference, especially, but all such conferences. We agree with, about use and exchange value, about imports and surplus value, and the driving nature of that whole uh, thing. But then when we confront Marx's work, we have this difficulty, that two difficulties. One is he didn't finish it, so then we have uh, different points where we jump off the train, so to speak. And the second is, of course, uh, how do we address abstract concepts? At what point are these applicable to the real? And that's a problem we all face. I mean, uh, I take the project to be that you should pay more attention to the development as you move along and be careful about jumping to the concrete too soon. Some elements are clear. Marx talks about the development of working day and the machine and all that. Other elements like money and effective demand and all of that uh, it requires much further development. So I see in this three volume and five book unfinished project uh, a foundation for a development of something uh, much stronger than it appears, than, it, than we inherit. So then, let me give you an example. If accumulation, as I understand it to be a key argument of Marx is, is determined by profitability and net profitability comes up very important in volume three, profit rate minus interest rate, and that's common to Marx and Keynes. Then you have to ask some questions such as what is the impact of an infusion of purchasing powers, debt, debt, budget deficits, which are so important as you say in the, in the Keynesian era and then led to limits. I would argue that in fact this is perfectly understandable. In some way, Milton Friedman is right uh, that uh, if you pump up purchasing power, you pump up employment. And you pump up employment, you can have an effect of pumping up the wage share. And the wage share has a negative impact on profitability. And so the first contradiction came was the fact that the profit rate was, the wage share was rising too much, so to speak. And the solution to that was to attack labor and then reduce the interest rate too, which is something at a concrete level becomes essential. And that produces your new liberal But of course, just like the first one has limits, the second one has limits. I don't see this at all contradictory to the underlying argument. And I would well, argue that Minsky on. can be in, in, in integrated into this, and Kolesky can be integrated, but not in the way taken just by themselves. So anyway, that's my project. And I, I don't see anything consistent, inconsistent with what you said with this overall project either. So I, 
I think one way to look at it is that perhaps we are much closer than we appear to be because we are talking about concrete phenomena and people whose arguments are related to that. But we do need to address whether those arguments are the same thing as an extension of this foundation. Uh, I agree word by word, even the comments. <laughs> Uh, I, I just have two, three things to say what is part of the original things that I propose. But I learned almost from 81, 82, I, I, I ever thought of having something original. But I devised a, a mechanism. If you do a little error in one point of time and follow it rigorously, you become a very original thing. On your theoretical first part, my point is that I tried to frame my narrative of neoliberalism, but also of the European crisis, uh, taking together and integrating what I call the capital fetish side of the argument and the constitution of the capitalist totality in the social <coughs> relation in production, in, uh, in the labor market, uh, etc., as groups, com uh, communities, etc. This usually is not done. Economists usually state that the capital fetish argument level to very interesting stuff uh, becomes more and more interesting in measuring, and that's okay. But have not really, if not at a very abstract level, never uh, uh, intersecting with the concrete argument, the second side. I try to show that the real subsumption of able to find, the uh, industrialization and centralization of the concentration, the precarization of labor force, even monetary uh, policy, are together. I could tell you about the story. Uh, starting from Greece by 95 when they asked uh, uh, from the economists of the Fed the natural rate is going down, you know that there is an this anecdote that they answered, oh there are some uh, nerds in California who are doing interesting stuff and there is the traumatized workers. And I, 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 I think you realize the connection between the two things. About the Minsky, I completely agree. Usually, I am taken to think, to say that I just add up an effective thing. In my attempt, it is the opposite. That's also why I started saying, look, <coughs> we must be critique of the political economy of our sense. You know, critique. Huh? That means I recognize what is Marx was a critique of Ricardo. He didn't reject Ricardo, but he uh, changed Ricardo. So this, this is... Uh, this is the, 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 the point. Uh, I would have other things to say, but for now I stop. I stop. Simon? Um, there's a, a great deal in this, in this paper, and it's difficult to get a, a handle on, on it all. But I want to focus on one very, very particular point, which was fairly early on in your presentation. You talked about the sequence from monetarism, 79 to 82, through the second Reagan military Keynesianism, through to neoliberalism, which dates as 1987, and I think regarded as more or less coterminous with Greenspan's tenure. Okay, my comment is, I just don't think the empirical evidence supports this chronology. All the significant macro breaks occur in the period 1979 to 82 in the US. 1979 to 82. If you look at the rate of exploitation, it's actually 1980. It starts to turn up dramatically. The rate of profit bottoms out in 1982. If you look at labor relations, it was the destruction of the Air Traffic Controllers Union in 1981 that was the important symbolic event. And the only exception to this is the really big surge in top incomes, which requires the Tax Reform Act of 1986. And that, in turn, presupposes the conquest of the executive and the legislature by 
near nucleus and the nuclear telomeres. So I think I think with your chronology, monetarism through military Keynesianism, Second Reagan era, through to Greenspan, I just don't think that's helpful. The, the break, the significant break is earlier, it's around 1980, and I think that in your chronology, you're just muddling that. Uh, again, I am not saying that monitoring is rare, and I didn't say it. it was not a break. I think that it was prepared. I completely agree on what the hour said about uh, Friedman being, in a sense, most regarded, <laughs> you know. Uh, I think that socially, since I think that empirical evidence is not just the data, yes, I know you can't uh, put them in numbers, but the inquiry in the working places and the reality also in the factory theory is relevant for me. Why? Because theory 80 was part of this book. Yeah? The struggles of finance. So usually the leftists say, oh, that was the moment in which the story started. No, the story started in the mid 70s, 34, 75, with the restructuring of the chain of production, which took years the introduction of electronics, the changing of the structure of the kind of firm, uh, going towards a major role of small and medium firms in different ways, uh, the role of the devaluation plus inflation. Uh, so the brain was prepared before. The brain was relevant from the point of view of breaking the working class. Uh, this went through also to the fall in investment, the attack on the welfare state in the paradoxical situation which created more and more deficits in the And it, it went on with then the start of the fall of the ship. What I said was this break was so big, was relatively big, was so big that uh, it created the condition of a global crisis. And why? U.S. and Reagan changed their minds, Latin America, uh, that crisis. They realized what uh, Sarkozy and Merkel realized in Greece, that when there is a huge uh, debt rate, there is a huge credit, and the credit can go in trouble. And what was the credit? The credit was, for Latin America, the U.S. banks. So what I'm saying is that my Keynesian story starts later on. Greenspan uh, is relevant, but I said very quickly that it was a kind of learning story. I suggest everybody to go and read Amos Berry, so the representative of God, who was Greenspan, in uh, uh, San Diego. Uh, conference early 2004, Piazza, and he was making a paper from eighties the American monetary uh, policy in the US, 87, 2003. He was an hero then because they started to go out from the crisis also in the world. Huh? In my view, actually, I didn't say this, the global crisis started in 2001. That was just uh, uh, more uh, of, of the same, more of the same mechanism. But he gives, in his own way, a learning story. In 87, he, he resolved the stock exchange markets. He gives the signals to the markets that they, that speculators can lose, can lose much, but can't lose everything, but they can gain whatever thing. Uh, it is a learning process going on with crisis elsewhere. The crisis as well help US, help the hegemony, help the, the, the markets in the US because of the flight to security, because of the territory from Japan, etc. And you are right, I, I understand my thesis is paradox, to the true model of neoliberalism, which is 1995, 1999, plus 
four years, Griffin uh, cuts demand supply, and the economy goes, uh, goes in there. Then the, the issue about 2007, 2015, why it comes? Because the raw materials start to rise, oil start to rise, huh? So in 2005, the central banks, 2004, 2005, 2006, have a problem. The problem is that there is a rise in commodity prices which does not come from them. So they start raising the rate of interest, not abruptly, but in steps. Then begin the plateau of the housing market, and from 2005 to 2006, the housing market goes down and everything unravels. Every crisis starts as a financial crisis, as I said before. This time, the financial element were crucially more relevant because the integration between finance and real economy was, uh, was bigger. And, uh, but at this point, I don't, I don't do a mechanic story, meaning that this is the most important part of the story. But it could have been something elsewhere. Huh? I don't have a theory which is able to explain the concrete starting point of the crisis. I'm able to say the, the mechanism. In this sense, I am like Minsky. I am one who saw the crisis coming. But like Minsky, I have seen five of the last two big crises. <laughs> exactly. Okay, thank you. I'm on. Um, let me use or abuse my position as chair. It seems to me that at least two issues, many issues that are coming up from the presentation and the discussion, which we may want to put on our list. We take them off again or not, it's another matter. One is, is it appropriate to see uh, where Marx ends, that's where Keynes, Kletsky, and Minsky begin. And uh, that's a long-standing issue, but it might be placed in the context of its relationship to our understanding of the equally slippery and contested notion of financialization. And then the other issue that might go on the list, which was uh, towards the end here, was what is the nature of neoliberalism, on which I think there is considerable contestation, and what implications does that have for the chronology of neoliberalism? We have a break now. Yeah, that's okay. okay.